yeah, I was watching a, um, I was watching a message the other week and uh, the preacher, he puts up the psalm and I'd, obviously I've, I've read the psalm before, but it was almost like it just like, when he read it out, it just like came at me and, and the psalm was, um, when my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolations delight my soul. And uh, that, that psalm actually really touched my heart. And uh, because we are living in uncertain times, we're living in weird, kind of strange times. And, um, you know, we need more than ever to be encouraged, you know, by the, by, the, by the unchanging word of God. The word of God never changes. You know, circumstances change, people change, the world is changing. But we know that we can stand firm on the unchanging an abiding word of God forever. And so I love the psalm here when it says that, yes, when my anxious thoughts multiply within me, but it's your consolations that delight my soul. So whenever we have a multiplicity of just uh, thoughts that are crazy, fearful thoughts, anxious thoughts, we know that we can begin to put our focus on the promises of God. You know, when I think about what Christ did you know, on the cross with the great exchange that all of my sin was charged to Christ on the cross and then exchange all of God's righteousness was exchanged to my account. It delights my heart, it delights my soul when I know that I've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus through what he did on the cross. The promises of God, the consolations, the encouragements, the, the, the comforting of the Holy Spirit, the comforting of the Lord delights my soul. It makes my heart happy, you know, so we can feel free to cast our cares and our worries and our anxious thoughts on the Lord. And I pray that your hearts this morning, just with the reading of this psalm here, that the Lord's consolations would delight your soul as well. Um, as you know, Ken just started a, uh, a message, a series of messages on Joseph. And... Uh, I love Joseph, but today I want to speak to you about a, um, another gentleman who goes by the name Joseph, but you probably wouldn't know it because he goes by another name, really, in the New Testament, and I believe that he embodies the title of my message this morning, which is Encouraging Grace. So let's just turn to the scripture, if it works. I'm going to be like Ken. Oh, it's not working. Is it? There it is. <laughs> so now Joseph, a Levite and a native of Cyprus, who was surnamed Barnabas by the apostles, which interpreted means son of encouragement. So Barnabas was one of the greatest encouragers in history, I believe. And later, as we go along with my message, this will become quite apparent. So... Barnabas' given name, as we can read here, was, was Joseph. But I'm sure you're, most of you would be familiar with Barnabas, but you probably would never have known that his name was Joseph because he kind of did the Gospel, or Luke, who actually wrote the, the book of Acts, only mentions his name that one time, his given name. So um, imagine being so well known for comforting and encouraging the people around you that people stop referring to you by your given name and choosing instead to call you by your nickname. And suppose that nickname becomes so common that some people who hear about you don't even know your real name. I didn't even realize his name was Joseph until I read that passage because his name was so synonymous with who he is as the son of encouragement. You know, and, uh, uh, just talking about nicknames that stick, um, in New Zealand, everyone gets a nickname. Uh, you know, I, you know I, I was, my family, my siblings, we all have nicknames. You know, and uh, uh, my brother, I have, a, I have an older brother and I have three sisters. So my older brother, his name is Jeremiah, and his nickname is Bimmy. It's short for, we call him Bim for short. And then my older sister, Esther, who you would have seen up on the screen there. You notice how she called me, she, she waved out to us, she said, hi boy, hi mum, because that's my nickname, is boy. 
because I'm the youngest and I'm a boy. And the youngest, who's a boy, is always called boy in New Zealand. But her nickname, Esther, is Tete, or Tere. We say Tere. And then I have uh, my middle sister. Her name is Jasmine. Her nickname is Muggy. And then my youngest sister, she has, a, she has quite a funny one. Her name is Tittywoo. That's T-I-T-I-W-O-O, Tittywoo. So when we interact with one another, when we're kind of like at, at family gatherings or when they come over or whatever, we never, we never refer to each other by our given names. It's just weird if we did that. But we always refer to one another by our nicknames. Okay, so uh, unless I was introducing them to you guys, you know, I'd call them by their given names, but that's just a thing in New Zealand. So I understand that with Joseph, AKA Barnabas, that his nickname would have just stuck and everyone just knew him as Barnabas, the son of encouragement. So his name is actually mentioned roughly 30 times in the New Testament, 23 times in the book of Acts alone, and then a couple of times in the New Testament. But he's always referred to as Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Um, you know, Keith Green, Keith Green once said this, if I can get this happening. You know Keith Green. Yeah, Keith Green, he just had this little funny thing that he would say. He said, seems like that when people found the Lord, they got their names changed. Jacob to Israel, Simon to Peter, then he says Judas to mud. <laughs> right? So what, what is in a name? What is in a name? Let's just look at the name Barnabas. You know, the name Barnabas... I looked it up in Strong's because that's what you do when you prepare for messages. You look it up. You look up Strong's, and the name Barnabas is a compound word, and so B A R Bar actually means son of, and then Nabus actually means prophecy, and that's something I didn't realise either. Son of prophecy, and I'll explain why that's significant later on. So let's look at this word sons. You know, I, I love a um, great grace uh, teacher, preacher, has a, has a really great podcast. His name is Brad Robertson. I don't know if any of you have heard of Brad Robertson. Great, just brilliant. If you haven't, just check out his podcast, Great Grace Teaching. But he had this really cool observation concerning this word son or sons. And so basically the word sons or son is a Hebrew term which speaks of a person's character or nature. So a person's identity is wrapped up in this word son. Now that could either be a good identity, that could either be a bad one. But I just wanted to give you some examples here. Some good examples. <laughs> oh, you all right? <laughs> it's crazy, I feel like I need to move forward again. Um, so yeah, so believers, we're called sons of God. We have the nature of Christ in us. Uh, we've been made new creations in Christ. Paul says in Galatians, he says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And then we come to another example, James and John. We know that James and John were pretty wild in their younger day. Uh, Jesus called them Boanerges, meaning sons of thunder. It was due to their aggressive and fiery nature. Not unlike the prophet Elijah, they wanted to call down fire on the Samaritans. Uh, then we have Jesus, the son of God. He's the unique son of God. And basically, it just means that he's 100% God. Jesus, the Son of Man, just means he's 100% man. And then we have Barnabas, son of encouragement. So we have Barnabas, who was the son of encouragement because it was his nature, was in his DNA to encourage. He wasn't a Sunday encourager. He was a 24-7 encourager. This is why the apostles gave him the nickname Barnabas, because of his encouraging nature. And his encouraging nature was just so obvious. It was just so evident in his life. Now, we all love to hang out with people that kind of stir us up. We all love to hang around people that kind of like, you know, you know really give us a lift up, you know, that really encourage us. And no one deliberately goes out to hang out with people who, who want to discourage them or who will discourage them or put them down. But unfortunately, you know, we have like, for example, we have kids who grow up in dysfunctional families, you know, who are told that, um, you know, they're useless and, 
you know, they, um, they're ugly, they're stupid, you know, they just have all these identity messages that are just poured on them like acid. And so being in that kind of environment is so destructive and it's toxic, right? And then we have the enemy who comes against us as saints. You know, the, the scripture says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness in high places. So we have, there's a, there's a spiritual element of, of discouragement that comes against us as well, where the enemy wants to bring us constantly under condemnation. So when this happens, this is what the psalmist says, why am I so discouraged? Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. You know, sometimes we need to encourage ourselves in the Lord when there's no one else around, uh, when everyone's got MIA, gone missing in action. You know, what we can do is we can begin to encourage ourselves in the Lord and say, I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. You see, because discouragement sucks the courage out of you, but encouragement puts courage into you. And I think I remember it was, uh, I think, Lindsay... Uh, a few weeks ago when he did communion he mentioned that encouragement just means to encourage or to put courage into you I believe he, I believe he said it originated from a French word but that's what courage, encourage means means to put courage into you so discouragement sucks the courage out of you encouragement puts courage into you so let's look at the word encourage that's used for Barnabas' name, son of encouragement. So in the Greek, the word is paraklesis, and it just means to exhort and to encourage. And we have here, it's primarily a calling to one side, uh, and so to one's aid, hence denotes an appeal, entreaty, uh, encouragement, exhortation, uh, consolation, and comfort. Now you notice that Barnabas is called the son of encouragement, and the Greek word is paraklesis. Is that word familiar to some of you? Because there is a connection to this word because we have the word parakletos. It's a legal term. It refers to the Holy Spirit or an advocate or a counselor and a comforter. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit is a ministry of encouragement and exhortation. And we have the Spirit of God living and abiding in us. And we also can begin to express that life of the Spirit or that encouraging factor, the same as Barnabas, right? So the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, has a, has a ministry of encouragement. And we are able to exhort and lift up and encourage one another in the grace of God. Amen. I love this. I love this scripture. It says, and Paul says, to pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him, however, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. And I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So remember, Barnabas, his name means son of encouragement. Oh, well, son of prophecy as well. So, but I'm not talking, so prophecy is not foretelling in relation to the scripture that I just read. And that is predicting the future events. Prophecy signifies the speaking forth of God's mind and his counsel. So much of Old Testament prophecy was predictive in nature, meaning predicting the future. Uh, prophecy is not necessarily or even primarily used to foretell the future, rather a declaration of what God, uh, a declaration of what cannot be known by natural means. It is forthtelling 
of the will of God, whether it be in reference to the past, present and the future. You know, I've always loved Bible prophecy. I've always loved eschatology, you know, the, um, the study of end times and that kind of thing. But that was mainly concerned with uh, future events. But Paul and the passage that I've just uh, read is not talking about that kind of prophecy. But he's talking about the gift, the gift of prophecy for the body of Christ. And Dr. Sam Storms gives a, quite a, um, I think he gives like a really simple definition of uh, prophecy, the human report of a divine revelation. Prophecy is speaking forth in merely human words of something God has spontaneously brought to mind. What God has spontaneously brought to mind. Because... You know, Paul exhorts the Corinthians to pursue love and to eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially to prophesy. Why? 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 <laughs> because the purpose of the gift of prophecy is to edify, to exhort, to comfort the body of Christ in love. And as Ken puts it, it's to build up, to stir up, and to cheer up. So love undergirds the gift of prophecy. And a loving heart is an encouraging heart. So it was totally good and appropriate that Barnabas was nicknamed son of encouragement or son of prophecy because obviously he had this gift to build up, to stir up and to comfort those who were around him, to comfort the body of Christ. You know, we always have an opportunity here in this church to be able to, you know, express, you know, uh, express like a word of prophecy or a word of encouragement and i've actually come to 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 um i like to call a word of prophecy a word of encouragement because that's what it basically is right it's a word of encouragement and we have an opportunity after we've worshiped the lord for people to to bring a word or a prayer or or whatever revelation or word of encouragement that the lord wants to bring so it's great that um you know god is speaking to us and god continues to speak to us and to lift us up and to build us up and to bring comfort to our hearts. And Barnabas was such a man of great love and his love for the church expressed itself in his bold generosity and his stand for others. Um, so I just want to look a little bit closer at Barnabas, obviously. Let's have a look here. Let's read the scripture. So all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them. All that were, um, oh, let me read this, so in them, all that there were, that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. And then it just continues to say that Joseph, a Levite, Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and he put it at the apostles' feet. So this time when all the believers were in one heart, one mind, there was, there was a lot of persecution going on from the Jews. And so a lot of Jewish believers, um, you know, they were affected in multiple ways. And they, obviously they were affected economically as well. So they, there was a loss of homes, loss of jobs. They were rejected by those around them. Uh, they were placed under a ban of total ostracism from society. But all the believers were of one heart and one mind. Everyone cared for one another's needs. There was no needy among them. And so we see the wonderful grace of God outworking itself in the lives of these early community of believers. We see such a, a great example of such caring and sharing among them. And it was a binding together in love, truly becoming a family as they were so involved in each other's lives and their needs. You know, Roz has mentioned couple of times today that we are a family and that we are involved in one another's lives in Christ and it's just natural for us to want to care and to share with one another as the body of Christ. You know um, when I was in Bible college and I think I may have mentioned this, uh, this story before but when I was in Bible college I ended up 
getting into debt with my uh, college fees. So my account was in arrears. Uh, I was doing okay, I was doing all right academically, but, um, but obviously paying my fees and uh, getting my account um, up to scratch just wasn't happening. Um, and so by the end of it, I wasn't actually allowed to, I couldn't actually graduate with my classmates at the end of the year. And, um, and so that was, a bit of a, that was a bit of a bummer. But I had this concern because now I had like this debt on my mind. It was a bit of a burden and it was about $900 that I owed, right? And uh, so I was thinking, okay, so during the holidays, so after graduation, I was thinking, okay, uh, during the holidays, I'm gonna have to work and save money. I'm gonna have to save $900 so I can pay for my college fees. And so as I was thinking about this, I, I ended up, um, I got a call from the liaison from Bible College. And uh, she said to me, she said, oh, Patrick, she goes, uh, you know, your, your college fees have all been paid up. And I was like, what? My jaw just kind of dropped. I was like, what? You know, my college fees have been paid up. And then she said, oh, yeah, um, you know, someone who, who wants to remain anonymous has paid your college fees for you. That was 900 bucks. So this person paid my college fees for me. And, um, you know, to this day, I have no idea who that was. But I tell you what, it was such a blessing, you know, because when you're in Bible college, you kind of get around one another and, and there's a real uh, camaraderie that really kind of happens and takes place when you're kind of in that just cauldron of just, you know, getting poured theology and ministry and all that kind of stuff. And so you really kind of do kind of band together and, um, and uh, it was just a great example of just being blessed from, you know, a person that I, you know, to this day I have no idea who it was, but it was a real blessing from the body of Christ to be able to do that for me. So, when we look at Barnabas' life, you know, he was among the saints who was quite a wealthy guy. Obviously, he was a wealthy guy uh, because he owned land. And um, it actually says here that Joseph was a Levite from Cyprus. Now, a Levite um, in the Old Testament under the law wasn't allowed to own land, right? Uh, and this is what it says says that is why the levites have no share of property or possession of land among the other israelite tribes the lord himself is their special possession as the lord your god told them so obviously he was from the tribe of levi and under the old covenant they weren't allowed to own land because the lord was their special possession the lord was their special possession but obviously by the first century that that rule it seems to have been relaxed a little bit because we see Barnabas was an owner uh, of land here. So, um, so Barnabas sold his field, brought the money to the apostles, and they would distribute the money to those in need. And, you know, there were other wealthy saints who also offered, um, you know, who had lands and sold lands and laid the money at the apostles' feet. But um, the reason why I believe Barnabas was mentioned because he was obviously a significant uh, he had a significant leadership position in the church. And then we don't hear from Barnabas after chapter 4 until we get to chapter 9 of the book of Acts. And you know, there are a lot of things that happen between chapter 4 and chapter 9 of the book of Acts. We've got, uh, we've got uh, what, Ananias and Sapphira. They did the same thing, but they lied to the Holy Spirit and then they, they basically they were killed. Right? They died. In the midst of the congregation, we had like the, the persecution of Christians and believers. And so, um, you know, we know that um, Barnabas was obviously a very influential leader in the church, but he wasn't among the apostles at all. So Barnabas was a man of great influence, though not an apostle. He was not numbered among the apostles and he was not a deacon. There were about several deacons that were appointed in the book of Acts. And we know that there are some notable deacons like Philip. You know, he preached the gospel to the Samaritans and to the Ethiopian. We have Stephen. He was the first Christian martyr. Right? So he wasn't among those leaders, but obviously his leadership was very important and very influential in the life of the church. And we'll see how influential his influence goes 
uh, later on. Uh, where are we up to here? Yep, let's just read. Let's just read about uh, his, his reputation among the saints was, was, uh, was amazing. So we read this scripture says, and Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but, not only, uh, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus Christ. And says, the power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. So when the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy, and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. And Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and strong in faith, and many people, and many people were brought to the Lord. Amen. We read here that you know the, the, the Jewish believers had been scattered because of a persecution, which I think that was a persecution that was kind of spearheaded by Paul the Apostle. And um, so they were scattered after Stephen's uh, martyr, martyrdom, his death. And they went out as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, uh, Syria. But they only preached to the Jews, these, these believers. But there were some believers... Uh, from Antioch who did preach to the Gentiles and basically what happens this church in Antioch just started to just it grew like gangbusters we had Jews being saved we had Gentiles being saved it was just a, it was just an awesome time of people just coming to the Lord salvation but when the Jerusalem church heard about it they were like oh well let's, let's see what's happening here obviously they needed some guidance so who did they send well of course they sent Barnabas. Um, you know, if ever you want uh, new converts like little babies and the Lord to be discipled and to grow in the joy of their salvation, you don't send a taskmaster. You don't send a, a lawgiver, you know, to, to go and beat the joy out of them, out of these new converts. You know what I mean? What you send and who you send is you send a comforter, you send an aid, you send an encourager. You send a son of encouragement. You send Barnabas, which is exactly what they did. And Antioch actually became like uh, Paul's headquarters when he would go out on his missionary journeys. Not so much Jerusalem. Jerusalem was like headquarters A and Antioch became like headquarters B, so to speak. So that church grew. So this is here, it says, When the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy. And what, what did he do? He encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. And Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and strong in faith. And many people were brought to the Lord. So what a reputation. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith. This guy was awesome. You know? And he was the key in presenting Paul to the disciples after Paul was converted. So let's read this. And when Saul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas, Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to them and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem coming in and going out. So we know, you know, we've, we've been in this church, those of us who've been in this church long enough, you know, we have, you know, a pretty good profile on the Apostle Paul, you know, before he became the Apostle Paul, he was Saul. And so Saul was obviously a noted enemy of the Christian church. He presided over the death of Stephen. And according to his own words, he considered himself, he was a blasphemer. He was arrogant. He was a persecutor. In the book of Acts, it says he was breathing threats and murder against the Lord's disciples, going from house to house, dragging Christian men and women, arresting them, throwing them into prison. He was just crazy, rabid, incessant in his zeal to stamp out the church of God. And then Saul encountered the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus and he was gloriously 
saved. And so he tried to join the disciples. And when you think about it, it's no surprise, you know, it's no surprise that the disciples in Jerusalem would be skeptical and afraid of him. They'd be thinking, was this a trick? You know, was he trying to infiltrate our ranks? Was he trying to destroy the church from the inside out? Was he, you know, what else was he, what, what was he trying to do? Was he trying to, you know, arrest us or, you know, execute us? You know, these fears were real for them. And so they weren't so trusting to believe that this man, Paul, had become a disciple. So what was Saul to do? Enter Barnabas. And you know, sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know. Someone will give you, someone who will give you the benefit of the doubt, someone who will take a chance on you. You know, when I was out of work, uh, oh, years ago, when I was out of work, you know, my brother, um, Bimmy, Bim, whenever you meet him, you can say, hey, Bim. Uh, he vouched for me a couple of times to get work. And so my, my brother's word was, was solid, right? And you see, I didn't get the job based upon my word or upon my reputation because I didn't have any clout with them yet. I got a job based on his word and on his reputation. So when Saul, Paul, uh, you know, when he was not accepted by the disciples, you know, he, didn't, he wasn't welcomed or accepted by them based on his word or his reputation because obviously they knew his reputation in the past. All right? But he was accepted on the basis and the sincerity of the sincerity of Barnabas's trustworthiness and his word. It was a son of encouragement. You know, Barnabas, he pleaded for Saul. He pleaded Saul's case before the disciples. He came alongside of him. He encouraged him. He exhorted him. He stood in the gap for him and put his own rep on the line for Saul. So Barnabas lived up to his name, the son of encouragement, and the result? So he, Paul, was with them, the disciples at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. What does that mean? It just means that they accepted Paul, you know, amongst them, in the midst of them. They accepted him. And now Paul could just come and go as he pleased based on the reputation and the word of Barnabas. This is how influential and how powerful this man was. Amen. So there we have Paul being accepted by the church because of what Barnabas, the son of encouragement, had done for him. You know, I said at the beginning of my message that, that Barnabas was one of the greatest encouragers in history, and here's why I think that statement is significant. This is just my thought. If not for Barnabas, we may not have the epistles of Paul, or history may never have told of the account of his missionary journeys, or, you know, where the gospel was preached, you know, to, to the Gentiles and to the world. And how tragic would that have been, you know, if we didn't have the, the epistles of Paul or, you know, discover the, about the history of his missionary journeys where he preached to the Gentile world. But we know that that didn't happen because we know that there was Barnabas. We know that because of this great man, you know, we can thank him for the fact that we have the epistles of Paul today and that we have the gospel presented to us in such clarity and such power today. So we can thank Barnabas for that. So great was the influence of this man that based on his reputation, word alone, the disciples welcomed and accepted Paul. And I want you to think about this. Without Barnabas, we may not have the Gospel of Mark either. Did you know that Mark, John Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark, was Barnabas' cousin? But during Paul's first missionary journey, uh, Barnabas and Mark actually accompanied Paul. But during that missionary journey, for some unknown reason, Mark deserted them. He just packed up and went home. Right? So this didn't go down well with Paul. Paul didn't appreciate that. Paul didn't appreciate the fact that he had deserted them. So when Barnabas and Paul were about to launch into a second missionary journey, 
the scripture says this. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. You notice there's always have flippy names, you know, John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention, the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. You know, I always wondered if this is where the word Barney comes from, you know? Have a Barney. That's sad, man. When I read that, that's like... <laughs> that's sad. So who was right? Was Paul right? Was Barnabas right? Was Paul right to say, ah, oh, you know, I'm, I'm done with him, you know? But thankfully, the, the story doesn't end there. Uh, later on, as Paul was a little older, and not long before he was uh, executed in Rome, Mark had actually become an invaluable part of Paul's ministry. And this is what Paul wrote to Timothy. He said this. Oh, no, oh, didn't say that. <laughs> he said, only Luke is with me. He said, and get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me in ministry. I think that's beautiful. Obviously, between the heated argument, the Barney, between Paul and Barnabas so many years before, and Paul's letter to Timothy, there was obviously a reconciliation. And Mark, whom Paul basically saw as useless at the time, was now profitable for Paul in service to the gospel. So who was right in the end? I believe Barnabas was right in the end. And just as I close... You know, we can all, uh, we, we all need Barnabases. We always will need Barnabases in our lives. And, uh, you know, when Lindley walked, walked through the door, Natalie goes, oh, Lindley's here. She goes, oh, that's so appropriate for your message because Lindley is such a Barnabas. You know, Lindley is such a Barnabas, such a perfect example of what being a Barnabas is all about. And we all need Lindley's, I mean Barnabases. <laughs> Now, we all need Lindley's too. Because we will always need to be edified. We'll always need to be exhorted and comforted in the Lord. Barnabas is such a beautiful example of God's grace and mercy towards us. He exemplifies the unfailing and extravagant love of God. Where God's love in Christ Jesus, um, we see Jesus taking upon himself the sin of the world, taking upon himself our sin. He took our place and he stands as advocate and he intercedes for us before the Father. You know, in the book of Acts, you know, it's mainly dominated by Peter and Paul. But within the pages, Barnabas, the son of encouragement, chooses to take a back seat, preferring to lift up others, not wanting to take the limelight for himself, but happy to aid and encourage the Pauls of this world to fulfill God's destiny and purpose for their life. Encouragers, I feel, enjoy the obscurity because exhorting is never about the exhorter. It's all about the exhortee. It's all about the one who is being encouraged. And like our Lord Jesus, who wants nothing more but to glorify the Father, and like the Holy Spirit, who, who wants nothing more but to glorify the Son. And these are definitely strange days that we're living in. And it's, and it's no surprise that fear and anxiety is at an all-time high. But we have hope as the body of Christ. And we have not been left alone to fend for ourselves. You know, the Lord told his disciples that he would not leave them as orphans to fend for themselves. Rather, he would send the Holy Spirit, to the comforter, the counselor, to aid and to help us. And he lives in us 24-7. And that alone is an encouraging fact to meditate on. You know what? Just as I finish, I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to your heart this morning. Maybe there's someone he's placed on your heart to share the love of God with, whoever that might be. It doesn't take much to lift someone up in the Lord. 
and listen for the voice of the Lord to give you the words to speak, words of life that fill the heart with joy and courage to encourage. You know, we can all be Barnabases. We can all live our lives that exemplifies the encouraging grace of God. You know, um, it is actually quite a daunting um, position to be in for myself when I'm sharing the pulpit, <laughs> uh, especially with such a noted uh, teacher of the grace of God like Ken. It actually can be quite daunting, <laughs> you know, but um, you know, in the words of Spider-Man, With great power comes great responsibility. That's, actually, that's, that's, that's Spider-Man's uncle. He says that to him. He says, with great power comes great responsibility. And you know, well, you know what? If Ken can quote Kung Fu Panda, I can quote Spider-Man. <laughs> but yeah, it is such a daunting kind of position to be in. But you know what? You know, we just trust God and... And I know that even this morning, as I was just sitting here at my notes, you know, just over there, and, um, you know, Julian comes up to me, who I consider, I think, I consider him a bit of a Barnabas too. And he comes up to me, and he just wanted to encourage me, you know, as I was preaching the Word of God this morning. And it's true. I was encouraged. I felt that infusion of God's presence and God's Spirit in me to, you know, to, to bring the Word today. But... Um, yeah, we can all be Barnabases. And let's live our lives that exemplifies that encouraging grace. Amen. Let's pray. Hallelujah. I want to leave you with that. <laughs> Encourage one another. Amen. Lord, we just thank you so much, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit and his comforting and encouraging coming around us and just filling us, Lord God, with your joy. And Lord, I pray that this message today in some way, Lord God, would um, encourage people, would exhort them, would lift them up today. Lord, as we go our separate ways today, I pray that we can remember that, um, yes, we all have the ability to be able to lift someone up and to encourage someone this morning, this day, this week, and uh, help us to be sensitive, Lord God, to your voice as you speak to us in our spirit. Lord God, help us, Lord God, to, yeah, just to listen. Just to listen. Listen what the Spirit of God is saying to the church today. And Lord, we thank you, God, that um, you were still speaking to us. Lord, that you were still speaking a now word to us, Lord God. That you were still speaking words of prophecy today, Lord. That you were still speaking words of encouragement, Lord. That we can begin, Lord God, to be stirred up to be built up, Lord, and to be comforted. And we thank you, Lord, for your presence and for your word. In the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's so encouraging. That's so encouraging. <laughs> Bless you guys.